Hey guys, so welcome back to the workbench. This is normally where we talk about ceiling fan history, trivia, and technical information. But today, we're, you might see we're at a different workbench. And um, <clears throat> today is because I want to introduce a little bit of a legend, I think. is So I, I don't feel like I... So Rick's here too, by the way. He's off camera. I, I'd say it's fair to say that among like people who know fans and instruments and things that I work on, I'm one of the people that other people come to when they get stumped. Would that be a fair to say? Yeah, I think so. I don't think that's me being like a dick or egotistical. I think that's just true. But when I get stumped, there's somebody that I go to, and he's been mentioned in any number of videos, but he's never appeared on camera before. And I wanted a chance to just kind of introduce him and let him tell his story uh, so that other people who don't have the privilege and luxury of coming to them um, when they get stumped just kind of know the mindset and the... Uh, you know, and, 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 and what approach you might want to take. So this is Chuck. I've, I've spoken about Chuck in my videos before. Um, most recently, he helped me retrofit a motor in that ANG Imperial. Um, he also rented me the old organ shop for many, many years. I've came to him with, with music instrument issues, with fan issues, with HVAC issues. Um, so let's start out. Why don't you start out and say how you got interested in fixing things? Like, even before, like... Well, the main reason is I could never afford to hire somebody to do things. If I was going to do... If it, had to get, if it was going to get done, I pretty much had to do it. And that's how I've learned a little, one thing at a time, a little bit over a little bit, you know, and over better than 50 years I've been fixing things. My dad was an automotive machinist, uh, mechanic slash machinist, you know, and, uh, of course, I hung around here with him. I was little, and then I got into cars. We don't even go there. <laughs> we can talk about that a little bit, sure. Yeah. But were you, when you were a kid, were you f f tinkering with things as a kid? I had an erector set. And yes, I love playing with my erector set and building things out of it. So besides, like, the erector set, like, you remember the first, like, non-toy thing that you actually worked on? Yes. Uh, I was always been infatuated with electricity. And I built little boards with electric circuits on them and switches and light bulbs and magnetic fields and stuff like that. And that goes way back, you know, I'm quite young at that time. And I forget just what I did. I think I built, you probably see there was a game out there, it was called heart surgery or something where you... Oh, operation? Um, operation. Yes. Oh. And you go in there and you try you, and hit the You can't hit the little... You can't hit the wire, the buzzer yeah. will go off. Yeah. I used to, you know, I like to build stuff like that. So did that predate your interest in cars? No, uh, pretty much not. Uh, my interest in cars just came to the fact that I loved cars when I was young. Started driving them, and then, of course, like I said, I had to fix them myself and uh, to get anything done, you know. So it, it almost sounds like the two things happen simultaneously. That you liked cars because everybody likes cars to a degree, and then you drove them, but then also you simultaneously were kind of learning how to fix things with the erector set and with building the circuit boards and stuff like that. Plus, I was blessed with uh, inherited mechanical skills right. from my dad, you know. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was kind of blessed with that, and I, one thing at a time. And like I told you before, when I was teaching, I used to teach electricity, and uh, I told my students, I said, I'm not a very smart guy, but I got a lot of experience. And I mm -hmm. taught school for 40 years, you know. I was a licensed master electrician, along with being an HVAC service mechanic on commercial equipment and stuff like that. I didn't do the electrical as a as a as a job. I, that was part of that was part of the HVAC thing, of course. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of yeah. electrical involved in H, H, HVAC. <coughs> so, but I'm not much of a talker. I can't sit here and talk to you and tell you about my whole life and everything I've done. But I'm going to let Dan ask the questions. <laughs> and, well, and I'll be glad to answer them. So, I mean, I guess we'll, we'll, I guess we'll go sequentially then, because like, so you got into cars, and then you went to school for HVAC. Yes, five year apprenticeship. And and what made you decide to go that route instead of like going to become an automotive mechanic? <laughs> oh, this seems like it's gonna be a good well, story. Well, high school, I took auto mechanics. <laughs> yeah. One, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The next year, I wanted to take auto mechanics too, which they didn't have. And I told them, I said, I, I plan on being an auto mechanic. For a living, and they didn't have, offer an advanced course in high school. Mm -hmm. And my dad knew I wanted to be an auto mechanic, and he was in that field. Mm -hmm. He said, "If you want to starve to death, just go ahead and be an auto mechanic." 
Yeah. He said, I know too many of them that are working two dollar earned jobs, part-time jobs and everything else just to put food on the table. He says, he really recommended against me being an auto mechanic. Mm -hmm. So I took up automotive as a hobby. And that's pretty much it. Did your dad recommend HVAC or that was just what was an option at the time? Or My dad was on a bowling league and he bowled with a guy that was a steam fitter. Uh, HVAC is a branch of the steam fitting business. And by the way, I recommend getting into that field to any young guy out there, any mechanical trade. Electrician, steam mm -hmm. fitter. Steam fitter is such a diversified field. You know, welding is real big right now in steam fitting. If you're a welder, That's... you're going to be working. You're going to make it sixty bucks an hour. Yeah, wouldn't doubt it. You know, as a, as a union shop or yeah. even the non-union shops doesn't matter. I was union, but I hold nothing against them. But it's a very diversified trade. Everything from welding to running pipe, process piping, steam piping, hot water piping, uh, plumbing is. Partially, our you know we don't do the plumbing because we don't mm -hmm. have, we aren't licensed to do drainage and uh, stuff like that. But, so plumbers and pipe fitters on a national basis are kind of a group. But uh, steam fitting trade, like I say, then you get into HVAC, air conditioning, refrigeration. Mm -hmm. Refrigeration is real big. Yeah. And then in order to do that, of course, you got to have a little bit of an electrical background, and that's how I earned my uh, master's electrician's license. Just by being involved with it, I don't even know codes, <laughs> but I know electricity. Yeah, if you yeah. know what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. So I couldn't go out and wire a house or a shop or something like that because I don't know the codes. You could just get a code book and yeah. and you or you could do it and it may or may not pass inspection, but it'd be well done and safe. Yeah. Versus you could get the code book and you could do it and it would definitely pass inspection and it would be yeah. well done and safe state of Wisconsin under uh, one of our past governors will give them an electrician's license if they've been doing it for mm -hmm. a certain period of time if they were born before a certain period of time so yeah you got grandfathered in I kind of got grandfathered in doing my past experience <clears throat> mm -hmm. well not to get off on a tangent about HVAC but I didn't realize so I'm somebody who loves working with electricity but I never liked the kind of paint by numbers of being an electrician like wiring a house there's not a lot of thinking that goes into it. You do your load calculations, and, and that's pretty much it. I love the thinking man's game. I love troubleshooting. I love, like, <clears throat> you know, but there's not a lot of electrical careers in that. There's not a lot of money to be made in that, because if you've got some little old lady that's calling you because her light switch isn't working, yeah, you can try to reverse engineer everything and figure out where it went wrong and, they'll, and charge her for three hours, or you can charge her for an hour and just run a new wire to it. Yeah. You know, and so, <clears throat> but I, I learned in large part th because of Chuck just how much uh, uh, cerebral engineering goes into HVAC. You get the hands on work. It's not like being an engineer sitting in an office, but you also have a, there's a lot of thinking that goes into the, the HVAC side of things, it really yeah. seems. And so. And reading wiring diagrams. That was one of the classes I taught is uh, HVAC troubleshooting and reading wiring diagrams. And as you know, reading a wiring diagram is very important. Yeah. If you're going to do any troubleshooting on anything, well, absolutely. Like I guess I just going off on this tangent. I say to anybody who's who's like me who likes working with mechanics and electricity, um, but like I said, you're you're more interested in in the in the you know you, you don't want to just have do this go in and do the same thing every day where you're wiring a house without thinking about it. HVAC HVAC seems like a really great trade to go into. It's a very diversified trade, and you can go into any branch of it. You know. That's true because I got a neighbor that all he does is sheet metal work. Yeah, and that's that's his side of it, and and he loves it. You mm -hmm. know, it's 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 not easy work. It's it's hard work, but it's you know he enjoys it and uh, makes a good living. Well, other than that, uh, I got a shop here, as you can see, and I can pretty much fix anything. So you got a new project in front of you. What is what what what's your methodology? Number one, figure out how it works, what it's supposed to do. And then take it from there. If this isn't doing what it's supposed to do, but you got to know what it's supposed to do, or you can't fix it. Yeah. And that's why where you come in with the fans, you know what it's supposed to do. Yeah. And I look at it and say, well, how can we make it do that? Right. You know, so I, I've got a very analytical mind, I guess, for troubleshooting mechanical things in general. You know, how, you got to know how they're going to work, how they're supposed to work. Without that, you're kind of lost because you don't know what you're doing then. I just want to go off on a little bit about that because... It's one thing to say, yeah, it's a fan, it's supposed to spin, it's supposed to blow air, but 
it also is important, and I think this is what Chuck means to know what each component of it does. This is the bearing. This is what this is what you know actually allows it to 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 spin with minimizing friction. This is the speed coil. It does the you know what I mean. Like you have to know what each every every part has a purpose because there's no company that's going to par- put a part in there that costs two cents if they can save that two cents. That's right. And yeah. so really, you have to look at it and say. Every washer has a, has a reason for being there. What's the reason for being there? So that's step one. What's step two? Oh, figuring out how you can do what you've got to do to make that part work. Yeah, that's about it. You just got to know what you want to make it do and try to make it do it with all your background uh, knowledge, I guess you might say, your experience. I mean, one thing that I've always appreciated is you seem like you have... A tool for every single purpose. I got a lot of tools. You've got a, a <laughs> very comprehensive collection of tools. Is there a particular thought process that goes into deciding which tool to try first for any particular? No, what I do is I look at something and then I scan my brain as far as what have I got for tools? What tool have I got that'll do that? Knowing what you're going to need to do it and get the right tool. My tools, I don't buy a lot of tools. I mostly swap meets and I inherited a lot from my dad when he passed away. And uh, most of my tools, a lot of my tools I got here are 60, 70 years old, hand tools that is. Mm-hmm. Of course you need digital multimeters and all this and that, uh, which you acquire. You have to spend a lot on them. You know, there's places out there, I won't mention any names, brand names. But, you can, this is very. You know, it's, yeah, it's good for the, not for the guys using it every day, like a professional. Yeah. If a guy that uses an electrical multimeter once every couple of weeks, yeah, or something like that, those 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 tools are just fine and they work good. You, are you alluding to Harbor Freight? Is that yes, I am. <laughs> no, I, yeah, I, I love Harbor Freight. It's, it's it, well, you you hit the nail on the head. It's it's not for your daily driver. It's for the thing where you where you 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 can get by with uh, uh, a lighter service version of it because you're not putting it to heavy use. Right, and then of course there's eBay and. Uh, Amazon. Amazon. Uh, they're a great resource for locating parts. Yeah. And then you get on for I'm on a lot of forums for different purposes. You know, I'm on a Dodge forum. I'm on a 64 Oldsmobile forum because I'm helping Rick restore his 64. Different Oldsmobile. Rick, but yeah. Different. You know, so you know, internet forums are great. Yeah. And all the people out there, they, they want to help you. They want to show what they know. Yeah. And they're going to tell you. The same thing bring... exists for fans, actually, too. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. People like to share their knowledge. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, so let's say that you're somebody that's that's handy, and let's just assume that there's not a particular thing of this person. This is just somebody that's handy that likes working on stuff. Maybe they're going to work on their car. Maybe they're a fan guy like me and Rick, or maybe they're going to work on just fixing stuff around the house. What, whatever, you know. They've got the basic tools. They've got screwdrivers. They've got a, a multimeter. They've got socket wrenches. They've got a, a cordless drill. After the basics, what would you say is the, the are the most useful or valuable or invaluable tools that you haven't, you know? Well, you... unfortunately, and especially in this day and age, it's, 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 talk to the Snap-on dealer. they got a special tool mm-hmm. for every little project or job that a guy has to do on cars and so on. Mm-hmm. Special tool for taking this part. To take special tool for... I don't have too much of that stuff. I get the tool as I need it. Yeah. But in most cases, the tool will pay for itself just using it once. It's, you know, Snap-on's expensive. But, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? The, uh, it'll pay, I've never had a problem buying a tool that I need uh, because I use it. It's kind of paid for itself, and now it's sitting on the shelf over there. Yeah. So that's kind of how I've gathered my tools, one thing at a time for what I needed it for. tool pays for itself. Uh, did a little construction work, you know, around the house. I went out and bought a circular saw and this and that. And, uh, you could always lend stuff out, too, if it's something else, you know. Well, you, you saw it today. People come by Absolutely, to use his stuff yeah. if they don't have it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Just got to make sure you give it back. But. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's right up here. You see that? Oh, yeah. Is Anything that, that leaves here no, it's, it, <laughs> gets it's written on, down there. It's on record. Yep. Because Chuck doesn't have a real good memory. <laughs> and this book right here, it's a 1968 motors manual. It's my Bible. <laughs> Most of the cars I worked on were 68 and older, 70 anyways and older. And My dad gave me that because it was one that was left over from his shop stuff. That's my Bible. All of a sudden one day I'm looking for my 68 Motors manual. And it's not there. And I gave up. I looked, I turned my house upside down, I turned my garage upside down, and I can't find my Motors manual. 
All of a sudden, one night at bowling league, one of our bowling partners said, Chuck, he says, remind me, he said, I got to get that book back to you. I said, what book? He says, remember that, that, that motor's manual that you lent me about three years ago? <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, no. I could have choked him. You know? So ever since then, I, well, yeah. my memory is not good anymore anyway, either. So if somebody borrows something, it's on the so list. I'm writing this down just to make sure to remind me. I yeah. trust you. Yeah. And I've never mm -hmm. had anybody take off and not bring something back, but I got to know where it's at. Right. Mm -hmm. you know? Just like you said, like that. that's a perfect example. You thought it was here. Yeah, well, you can see there's a whole list that's all crossed off up there. So you got back. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, I I think that pretty much covers it. Uh, is there any other advice that you'd have for people that are just again they're trying they're just trying to learn how to how to fix things, you know, in terms of you know maybe they have the innate mechanical trait. I think most people that 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 go into that have at least some, uh, you know, some inborn abilities well, and that's just the thing not everybody's created equal yeah and you got to have something up here that allows you to learn mechanical things and i know several people that don't know how to do a damn thing mm. i don't know one of my best friends uh didn't even know what direction to turn the screwdriver to get a screw loose yeah you know and i don't think he could ever learn it you know he was a professor yeah, yeah. you know and uh but you know th things like that you know you just you got to have it if you don't have it you don't have it and I was blessed getting mechanical background. It's yes. called mechanical aptitude. Yeah. I worked with a welder once, and he says, most people are only born with about a 50% mechanical aptitude. He said, this guy was quite a guy. He said, I was born with 99%. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he was. Oh, I believe he it. Was a, oh, yeah. He was a good welder. He could, he could tack a pipe up, mm -hmm. and he'd actually, when it was supposed to be perfectly vertical, he would tack it up so it was like this. And he knew that when he welded this side of the pipe, that weld was going to shrink how much and bring that pipe right back up to vertical again. Because welds do shrink when they cool. Mm -hmm. You're putting it in at 3,000 degrees or whatever the temperature is. And when it cools, it contracts and it pulls. Have you ever welded something and held onto it and you can actually feel it moving? That's, that's the weld contracting. Just things like that. But yeah, he was, he was born with 99%. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Where would you where would you rank yourself? Or you don't? I don't know. I think maybe fifty percent. I'd say you're over fifty. I, I learned the rest so. of it by the yeah. hard way. <laughs> but um, what well, you did teach for many years, as you mentioned earlier. Do you? I mean, what was what did you what did you learn from teaching? What did that teach you? Well, I was an older guy, and my apprentices were all younger people, and you wouldn't believe what you can learn from younger people. Mm -hmm. You know, they're digital stuff. Okay. Mm -hmm. They're in that digital stuff. I'm not. I learned that kind of stuff from my apprentices. Uh, that's pretty much it for that. I, and I like passing on what I knew to them. And hopefully they pass it on to somebody else. And uh, yeah, 40 years teaching apprenticeship programs. Everything from refrigeration to knot tying to mechanical, electrical troubleshooting. H, what was it called? I forget. HVAC troubleshooting course. Basic electricity was where I pretty much started out. Yes, the basics. You got to know the basics. You got to know how electrons flow and resistance and ohms and amperage. And you got to start there and then go on. Hey guys, so the conversation with Chuck was so great that we talked for about an hour. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to split it up into two parts. You just watched or listened to the first part and the second part will be coming in the next workbench video. Um, the first part is mainly advice, and the second part is mainly stories. So I look forward to seeing you at the second part. Also, Rick took some footage of the cars that were currently in Chuck's shop. I will be uploading that separately. You should check that out. You should check out the video of Reese at Chuck's shop from like 10, 15 years ago, however long it's been. Um, so, uh, And then also I'm going to put up some footage from Rick and Chuck working on Rick's abandoned fan. So I hope that you're as excited about this content as I am. As always, please like, comment, subscribe, patreon.com slash dspiffy for content you might not see otherwise and behind the scenes. And support our sponsors, Fanstick, Lightstick, 
Rickership.com, Taco Burrito, Mexico, the good manufacturing company, 81220 LLC, Florida Fanstick, and anybody else I might be forgetting. As always, thanks for watching, and bye Fanstick.